morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, it's my first, first 5G event at Hudson. <laughs> um, so I thought today I will introduce the speakers uh, and then essentially moderate a discussion. Um, our speakers are both experts on 5G-related issues. Uh, we have a series of questions that we can talk about. And then I'm happy to take questions uh, from the audience toward the end. And we will end promptly at 11. So thank you. So uh, first, I'll introduce um, Harold Fershgott Roth and then Rob Spaulding. Um, Harold is the director of the Center for the Economics of the Internet at the Hudson Institute here. Uh, prior to this, he's done many things in his career. Uh, he was a visiting fellow at AEI. He wrote a book called A Tough Act to Follow about the difficulties of implementing the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And from 1997 through 2001, he was a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. In that capacity, he served on the joint board. He served on the joint board on universal service, and he's one of the few economists to have served as a federal regulatory commissioner, and the only one to have served on the FCC. Rob Spaulding um, is a Friend of mine, we work together on the National Security Council. He's a retired brigadier general in the Air Force and has also done many things in his career. Among them, I will just highlight a few. He was a key person in drafting and helping to draft the national security strategy of the Trump administration. Um, he speaks uh, a fluent Chinese and spent time in China as an Air Force officer. You were the DAT, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, he's also a skilled combat leader. Um, he, had, he led the 509th Operations Group, the, only, uh, the nation's only B-2 stealth bomber unit, uh, and he's, he's done a lot. So um, I'm really happy to have him here today. So I thought I would begin the discussion a little bit with talking about 5G in a general sense. Um, I really learned a lot about the topic when I was working on the National Security Council and specifically helping to draft the national security strategy. We actually have some language in there on 5G, thanks to Rob and others. As many of you know who've looked at the strategy, a key feature of it is its discussion of the nature of the competition out there, the military, political, and economic competitions taking place, all accelerated by technology. This is a, a theme of the document and a theme of, of the Trump administration. And 5G is really part of that landscape of the competition, what's happening there, both economically, because it will be so important to our future economy, and also from a national security perspective. Uh, so I think in some ways it really is a litmus test for kind of understanding how the country is going to think about this competition over the, the near to medium term. I mean, it's happening now. So why don't we um, start with, um, with Harold to, to start uh, a little bit, uh, your perspectives on 5G, kind of paint the landscape and the picture, and then we'll go to Rob. There are different views, and Hudson is a place where diverse views can and should be debated. So there are different views on how the United States should best tackle the 5G challenge, and I think we'll hear some of those today. Well, th thank you, Nadia, and thank you for organizing uh, this session today. It's a great honor to be here with you and Rob. Um, 5G, 5G is a type of wireless uh, technology. Once every five years or so, there's a new generation of wireless technology, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G. Sounds a little bit like a Dr. Seuss book. 5G is the next generation. And uh, unlike the prior generations, which you could come up with a very specific definition of exactly what the capabilities were, uh, which uh, bands of spectrum it could operate on, exactly what its technical characteristics were, look like. 5G is going to be a little different. Uh, it won't be limited to specific bands. Uh, it will operate in a lot of different bands, very often in combinations of bands of spectrum. It, we could think, you can think about it in uh, a few different characteristics. One is speed. It's going to be substantially faster than uh, current speed. Latency, uh, the, uh, the, the time lapse between uh, sending a signal and receiving a signal is going to be shortened a great deal. In capacity, the amount of information that can flow is going to be substantially greater than today. Uh, the current plans, a, a lot of wireless carriers plan to deploy 5G technology in the next year or two. Uh, some countries, such as China, have already deployed uh, a, a great deal of 5G technology. Uh, and uh, it, is, it has become one of the 
central points of tension, if you will, between the United States and China over the past uh, couple of years, I would say. Uh, China has made 5G technology one of its strategic initiatives at, at the, uh, the central government level. And I, they've been very successful at it. It, it uh, is something where uh, uh, the, the central planning of China has, has been able to uh, insinuate China into 5G in ways that uh, did not exist in, in prior generations of wireless technology. Uh, and the issue I think we'll be discussing some today is, is, uh, is this something that the United States as, as a government should respond to in some way? Uh, and if so, uh, what should that response look like? Exactly. Perfect opening, Rob. Um, and a perspective also on how uh, 5G not only will change our economy, maybe in some specific ways, but also the implications for national security. Yeah, and uh, as you know, we um, discuss the importance of the information domain in the national security strategy, and really 5G is at the heart of, of how the information domain is changing. I got my first uh, modem, and I got on the Internet in 1995, I think. You know, 2007, with the introduction of the iPhone, was a time that, that you know, the Internet really moved from, you know, just being stuck on the computer to your mobile device. I think this evolution of wireless and, and bringing the internet together with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, big data, and machines is going to be a fundamental change in our lives, primarily because we're not going to see uh, very much change in terms of how our mobile devices perform, but certainly we're going to see a whole bunch of machines that start to show up uh, outside our door that are doing things for us in a very beneficial way. So when you look at it in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the national secure, security um, perspective, uh, Europe dominated 2G, 3G, uh, the U.S. dominated 4G, and the Chinese uh, essentially decided that they're going to dominate 5G. Well, when you build out most of the world's infrastructure and you realize that most of, uh, most of the traffic is going to migrate to these wireless networks, then you have enormous power to do surveillance. You have enormous power to use the machines are connected in ways that aren't intended by their owners, and you have a huge, um, a, a huge uh, ability, uh, specifically with big data um, uh, and artificial intelligence, to begin to influence populations. And we saw that uh, in the 2016 elections. We continue to see it both from the Russians and the Chinese. And um, as uh, the National Endowment for Democracy and the Hoover Institution demonstrated, there is enormous influence going on in the world today. Um, and that was with you know, 4G technology. You know, imagine what that will be like uh, when there's such pervasive amount of data and understanding and the ability to implement that at a, at a very fine level. Uh, it, it's, in, it's, it's staggering. I want to talk a little bit about the relationship, just as um, I mean, some of you in the audience might be as new to 5G as, as I am, the relationship between the infrastructure of, of 5G and then what runs through it, and who produces the infrastructure, and some of the, the nature of the, um, the landscape there in terms of American companies, Chinese companies, because not everyone might be familiar with that, and it's an important component to what we've seen in the news. Sure. Uh most of us are familiar with uh, different manufacturers of handsets. Um, I happen to have an Apple. Some people have Samsung. Uh, there are a variety of manufacturers of handsets. The handsets don't really talk to each other very much. Mostly uh, traffic goes, uh, actually 85% of traffic goes through Wi-Fi. Uh, we'll, I can talk about that separately. But a lot, of, a lot of the discussion has to do more with the cellular networks. And today, there are essentially four manufacturers that have complete suites of network equipment. Uh, and, and those would be Huawei from China, Samsung from Korea, uh, Ericsson uh, from Sweden, Nokia from Finland. Um, there are other companies, such as Cisco, that have some parts of the suites of network equipment. Uh, there are other companies uh, that license technology that's used in uh, network equipment, uh, whether it's Qualcomm, Intel, others. Uh, but in terms of major manufacturers, uh, actually, Cisco is a partial manufacturer, but most of the manufacturers are not American. 
Uh, Huawei, on the other hand, uh, is is the uh, has uh, staked out a position in 5G. Uh, they've um, have deployed uh, hundreds of thousands of base stations uh, in China and uh, in other parts of the world. Their contracts for uh, Huawei equipment uh, in uh, dozens of countries around the world. Um, so that's on the the network equipment side. Um, and the, uh, the the landscape is, um, uh, in, in part, one of the questions is how many how many companies can survive in the market for five G network equipment. Um, in the past, uh, if you go back twenty years ago, there were probably a dozen different manufacturers for wireless network equipment. Uh, some of those companies, most of those companies don't exist anymore. Uh, they've gone out of business or they've consolidated in some way. Uh, as technology has advanced, uh, the importance of economies of scale in the manufacture of this equipment uh, has become more important. The number of viable companies uh, it has probably shrunk. And uh, I think one of the questions right now is, is how many how many companies can survive in a, in a 5G network world? And then going forward, you know, again, every approximately every five years or so, there's a new generation of wireless technology. Uh, and uh, what, what is the future for the manufacturing of uh, network equipment in the, the wireless space? Rob, do you want to comment a little bit? Yeah, the bottom line is we've seeded our ability to uh, manufacture microelectronics, which if you consider you know, if you had a potential adversary and you were going to allow them to manufacture all your weapons of war, that might be put you in a, a certainly a challenging position. As we've said, the information domain is the most important domain in the 21st century. Data is a strategic resource. And to the extent that you allow the hardware that, that carries that data to be manufactured in a totalitarian state that has uh, values and principles that are inimical to yours, you're essentially putting yourself at, at, at their whims. I, I would note that um, we've done very little manufacturing of electronic equipment in this space probably for 20 years in the United States. Uh, most electronic manufacturing in the world today uh, is, goes on in China, uh, and uh, uh, some of it by Chinese-owned firms, a lot of it by non-Chinese firms. Uh, and that transition to manufacturing in China has been going on for, for quite a while now. It does, it does present problems that, that Rob notes, uh, but this is, this is not a new problem and not unique to 5G, I would say. So what are some of the alternatives now to change? Uh, what alternatives do we have in front of us um, to change course or to shape the landscape in a way that's favorable to U.S. interests or at least not, not harmful? And then second, I think we need to talk about the role of allies and partners and other states and how their decisions today are likely to impact us. Um, Rob, do you want to? Yeah, so um, just remember uh, when you came into the White House, the discussion at that point was economic security and national security are completely separate things. Like, we don't, we don't consider them even to be on the same planet. The NEC does its thing and the NSC does its thing. That's not the final conclusion we came to in the national security strategy. Economic security actually underpins national security. And so the idea that um, you, you can seed um, everything that you do in your economy to the market does not necessarily uh, bode well for a future where market forces are essentially being undermined consistently by uh, players that don't abide by um, fair rules. So, I mean, it is a fair question how many players can the, can the market and the industry sustain, but a, a far more important question is how do, we, how do we prevail in a world where there's such a you know, complete um, uh, disavowal of any of the international rules when it comes to industry? And so um, it's not a mistake that microelectronic manufacturing went away in the United States. Uh, that, you know, I would contend was part of a deliberate strategy. It wasn't just business. It w there was uh, definitely, other than market forces going on, 
I believe that um, there is a national strategy in China around telecommunications, specifically dominating telecommunications, not for a market-based decision, not for uh, solely an economic decision. It's a national decision, and it provides an enormous power in a world where we're so connected. Um, yeah. Look, I, I, I agree with uh, I, I agree with that. I, I think the um, um, uh, I, 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 it, it, at the end of the day, I think the uh, important thing for the United States, though, is is we are uh, we are a, a free market country. Uh, we are a country in which uh, new technologies have evolved uh, in a free market uh, society. Uh, and I'd say the wireless industry is is maybe the greatest example of that. Uh, the wireless industry developed uh, not because of government interference, but precisely by the absence of government interference. Uh, for much of the past uh, 30 years, the wireless industry has been the least regulated industry in the United States. Uh, for the prior 30 years, from the late 1940s to uh, the uh, late 1980s, uh, in fact, it was government regulation that prevented the development of wireless technologies in the United States. Um, uh, I, I, the, the way that the, uh, the United States has developed well in wireless technology has been with a very light touch of, uh, of government regulation, and I think that's probably uh, the best path forward. Um, China presents, I think, the exact opposite approach, which is heavy central government planning, heavy central government regulation. Uh, and uh, that's 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 a way that may work for China. I'm, I'm just not sure that that's the best approach for the United States. There are security issues, though. I think one you know one of the issues that I've grappled with is how do you impress upon uh, the private sector and and I would say the wireless industry specifically also the importance of security, where they haven't they just haven't emphasized it uh, in their spending in their business plans. It's not. Uh, an issue of importance to them. And so it seems that one uh, key way forward is somehow to develop a shared consciousness, as uh, I like that term, General McChrystal used it in his, his book, a shared consciousness of the problem uh, by, the, by you know, in, the, in this case, the wireless industry, but even more broadly. Um, that seems to be an important first step because, well, the, the technical experts will know, but 4G is not a secure system, right? It's, it's very, very vulnerable uh, in many ways. Uh, and so that also leads to some of the, the um, implications for national security and the military and DOD's thinking about 5G. So could you comment on how you get the private sector to understand the problem set in a different way, and does that matter? And then to Rob, if you could go into a little bit more of how DOD is seeing 5G. Yeah, I think, um Look, we're at an inflection point in history in terms of where uh, technology impacts our, our everyday lives. I, th I would agree that at, at one point we were dominant in wireless. I think we've lost that. In, in, in fact, the Chinese have accelerated past us. Today, I think we're 62nd in terms of wireless speed in the world. We're about fifth most expensive. In other words, uh, five, six times the cost uh, of uh, what somebody pays in Hong Kong for connection, five times what they pay in Stockholm. Uh, 34 million Americans don't have access to broadband, uh, you know, unless you uh, want to define it at the incredibly low speeds that the FCC is currently defining it as. Um, not only that, but um, even the wireless companies themselves don't actually think of themselves at wireless, as wireless companies. The CEO of AT&T was here last week talking about his competitors. Who did he call his competitors? Disney. Last time I checked, Disney wasn't a network company. They're an entertainment company. So. There, there has been a change in the business models within the wireless companies. They've basically stagnated on the customers they have. Their, their business models have transitioned to let's increase revenue per customer. Let's do that by being content creators and content owners and content distributors. It's not about building uh, um, the network. The AT&T CEO, the Verizon CEO, the T-Mobile CEO does not get up every single morning and think about how do I secure, how do I protect the American people thinks about how do I uh, increase revenue for my shareholders. That's their fiduciary responsibility. There is a role for government in thinking about the, what we have called the most important domain in the 21st century, how we protect Americans' data. 
If you go around today, does anybody in this room expect that any of the thing that they do is actually secured from either a state actor or just a regular hacker um, uh, you know, in their basement? No. Everybody has basically became, become um, used to the fact that we essentially have no freedoms when it comes to the digital space. There is an obligation to design that in the technology. Now, we've allowed it to develop organically in democracies to the point where it actually threatens democracies uh, to now. And so with the introduction of 5G, that's only going to accelerate. You know, rather than 10,000 devices for, you know, within the square mile of this location, you're going to have 3 million. And that's going to be far more pervasive in terms of what the data aggregators know about you and how they can influence your lives. Today, it's Amazon. Uh, it's, it's Google, it's Facebook. Tomorrow it's going to be um, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and the Chinese Communist Party. Um, well, let me note, note a couple things. One is um, Huawei technology uh, is, is not in um, uh, the networks of the major wireless carriers in the United States and has not been there for for several years now, um, when uh, Sprint, Sprint acquired Clearwire in 2013, uh, one of the conditions of the acquisition was to get rid of, of Huawei equipment. Uh, the concern was uh, uh, potential uh, uh, security problems with the Huawei equipment, uh, not necessarily collection of information as much as uh, just how reliable and how easily hacked the, the equipment was. Uh, there's growing concern about uh, Huawei equipment in uh, uh, both the United States and, and in uh, many other countries around the world. Um, uh, I think Rob raises a, a good point uh, about uh, the difference between different uh, types of equipment and the type of security we, we think we have with the information that we have. Uh, and uh, that, is, uh, that is something that's been going on with all levels of wireless technology. It's, it's not, new to, uh, not new to 5G. Uh, but the, uh, the, the sense of how secure your information is, uh, who is, who is looking at it, whether it's uh, state actors or government actors or, uh, frankly, commercial companies that simply use the information that you have. It's, it's something that's been going on for, for quite some time. The, the last point Rob made is, 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 is also probably the most important. As important as are the actual networks and wireless services, uh, the even more important uh, uh, services are the the, uh, uh, the online services that ride on top of them. The largest corporations in the world: <coughs> Amazon, uh, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple. Apple's maybe a little different. But the others, uh, they're, they're not actually based on network equipment. They're not actually based on uh, uh, providing direct wireless services. They are the services that ride on top of them. And uh, today, uh, those corporations, uh, the largest ones in the world, tend to be American corporations. There is a generation of parallel companies in China uh, that uh, uh, look an awful lot like the American companies, and, and they're, they're doing very well in, in many parts of the world. Uh, much larger uh, potential than actually just providing the basic communication services. Yeah, to answer your question on DOD, a DOD is still, um, you know, I would, I would say preoccupied with the lethality as their primary goal. I would say um, in the information domain, there's a lot you can do to undermine democracies without getting lethal. And there's an obligation for them to begin to think differently about the world. I mean, it was clear in the national security strategy, we need to think differently about the future, particularly as it relates to artificial intelligence, the use of data, and how pervasive that gets injected into our societies. DOD can't wait until essentially their, the society's been undermined beneath them before they begin to think about what's their role in defending the population. 
it's a completely, it's a interesting in terms of thinking about the nature of homeland security, right? It's a different approach, you know, thinking well, about. Well, well, you think about why militaries were developed in the first place. They were developed to protect populations from being coerced by um, other nations. Well, when you can actually go right into the heart of the society and begin to undermine it from within, then you know, the, the, the nature of how you defend that, really you have to think differently about that. Well, there are about 58 countries now that have already agreed to incorporate um, Chinese hardware into their systems. Are, are things proceeding in a way that's inexorable? I mean, are there decision points in the future? And I think that that's important, actually, for a place like Hudson and, and other think tanks as well to think about. Are there key decision points in the future uh, which can be shaped, right, where both the private sector needs to be thinking about that in a strategic way, um, DOD, uh, the role of uh, working bilaterally uh, with allies and partners on this problem set? Is this a multilateral problem set where we need to create new fora to deal with this in the near term? Any thoughts? Well, you're right. A great many uh, carriers around the world uh, have signed contracts or at least letters of intent with uh, Huawei to, uh, to use their equipment. Um, I'm not sure how much these are DOD issues as, as other types of issues. Um, wireless carriers around the world um, are, are private companies. Uh, they're private companies even in, even in China and, and even in North Korea. The, the, the wireless carrier there is the North Korean government couldn't possibly do that, so they brought in some private company to handle their wireless services. Um, and, and these these wireless companies uh, are exactly what Rob said. They're, the CEOs of the companies have fiduciary responsibilities to make money for their shareholders. Uh, they wake up in the morning, they're less concerned about security than they are about, uh, about profitability. Um, and, and the wireless carriers typically, they do contracting the way all businesses do. They'll send out a, an RFP, they'll get various proposals, uh, and, and Huawei has been, uh, uh, and they'll get proposals probably from Samsung, Nokia, Ericsson, maybe some other companies as well. It, Huawei has been uh, very low on costs, uh, and then uh, they've been also able to put together packages of financing either directly from Huawei or from the Chinese government that have been incredibly attractive. Uh, not just in developing countries, but in, in European countries as well. Uh, and the combination of a low cost and very attractive financing uh, has, been, uh, has been very difficult to, uh, to, for the other companies to compete with. Um, is that something that, do you, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't really have a yeah. silver bullet answer for you. Um, uh, there has been some growing resistance, though, on the security side. National intelligence services in various countries, particularly in Europe, have been very um, concerned, have expressed those concerns uh, to their national governments. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of these are private companies making these decisions. And the relationship between <coughs> national governments and the private carriers about how those decisions are made is, is going to vary country by country. Yeah, and I think allies and partners are looking for America to lead. It's, it's not, uh, you know, it can't be just no way Huawei. It's got, what is our, what is our strategy to lead the free world in this, in this 21st century where information dominance is absolutely critical to maintaining your freedoms? That's, that's something that our allies and partners are asking. So if you just come to them and say, hey, well, we don't want you to install Huawei. Okay, well, what's your plan? I don't think that's a that's a winning um, that's a winning strategy. I would note that um, you know uh, President Eisenhower built a highway system that was ostensibly made for national security reasons. It was connected to our air force bases, but um, I would venture to say that most of us enjoy the lives we do today because of the trucking uh, system that goes along that highway system that was built ostensibly for national security reasons. So. Um, I, we, let's go back to the space race. We engineered most of our, or we taught most of our scientists based on federal uh, grants for them to go get um, 
engineering degrees to work on the space program. Most of our technology that we've been living the fat off the fat of for the last 40 years was, was actually created by a lot of the um, U.S. investment uh, during the Cold War. So it, is not, it would not be the first time that national security actually injected lifeblood into the innovation uh, system of this country. I'm going to open it up soon for questions, so start thinking. And then I'm going to put my friend Chris Walker on the spot, too, back. <laughs> um, because he's done a lot of work on this at NED. So, um, and I'd be interested in, in some of your comments. Um, I'm going to ask one more question specifically about spectrum. Um, and 5G, uh, Internet of Things, military national security, and spectrum availability um, for the military. Do you want to comment on that a little bit, Rob? Because that's also an important part of this. Yeah, I think, um, I think the, the spectrum problem is overblown. Look, I, I don't agree um, uh, that probably the best way is to, is to auction off spectrum and then let companies sit on that and not use it. So uh, that's been going on quite a bit. Um, I would say that with, uh, with 5G, in terms of how you can do network slicing, how you can do um, um, uh, use multiple spectrums, as Harold was talking about, there's an opportunity here for rethink the way, to rethink the way we use spectrum. I don't know. I don't have an answer from a policy's perspective in terms of should you know, DOD give it up its spectrum. I know DOD has um, been harmed in the past by uh, having to get a spectrum that they thought that they needed for their mission. So I'm not going to speak about that. What I will say is um, we put men on the moon. We did awesome things. We can figure the spectrum th deal out. And it doesn't have to be the companies calling the shots. We can put a lot of smart people in the room and say, how do we divide the spectrum in a way that uh, benefits the American people? Rob, uh, would you be satisfied or would you feel a little bit better if companies, even if a few out there, um, indicated that they recognize the urgency of this problem set, that they have a role in, in protecting democracy and the landscape which they have emerged from, right, essentially? Yeah. So is it possible or is that too? I don't, I don't think it's possible. And that's primarily because of the way they've managed their, their companies. Uh, they're, most of them are heavily laden with debt. They have enormous 4G um, investments that they have to take care of. So they're, right now, they're just not in a position to move in a way that the nation needs to move strategically. Now, could they, could they come up with um, a game plan to perhaps um, uh, join forces and, and do something uh, for the country? I think they could. But you know, um, it, it, they're not going to do that without some kind of incentive in the system for them to do so. Right now. They, um, they uh, have a responsibility. This is the way our system is designed, like it or not. We have, we have free markets, and we have uh, democratic principles, and they go together, and they work together. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, it doesn't work to get us out of uh, a situation that we're in. That's why we had things like the national highway system. That's why we had the space race. There are times when we need to think differently about how we do things. But uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take leadership from government saying, this is what we need. And it can't be just, hey, AT&T, we need you to do this, because how, how, would, how would they be incentivized to do so in the current system? They're not. Right. So at the very least, we need a clear sense of what kinds of incentives need to exist, Right. like the nuts and bolts of that. And again, that would be, that's not something that we can, the three of us can develop on this panel this morning, but it is something uh, that can be done. Um, Harold? I, let me just make a couple points. Uh, one, uh, I, I do think the 5G plans of uh, American wireless carriers are being uh, constrained by uh, spectrum availability. Um, uh, it, it's, it's just been, there, there's a lot of spectrum in the pipeline coming from the government to get to the FCC to be licensed off. Um, and um, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of spectrum that uh, will eventually be used for 5G that's in that pipeline. Um, second, keep in mind, the, at least specifically on Huawei, there, there is no Huawei equipment in the wireless networks of the major American carriers, uh, and there hasn't been for years. Um, uh, you mentioned Randall Stevenson, the CEO of AT&T. Uh, he gave a speech last week on this, on this Huawei issue, and I'm, I'm not sure he would what he said was very consistent with what we've been saying up here. Um, 
So it, it, it's not that uh, the, the American wireless carriers are uh, somehow uh, uh, unaware of uh, security issues. Uh, but Rob does make a good point. They, they at the end of the day, uh, that is not their primary objective. Their primary objective is to have a profitable business. Um, uh, the, um, the the types of security, the, the types of wireless networks that are available throughout the world uh, are, are frankly, they're frankly the same uh, because there are only a handful of manufacturers of network equipment. Uh, so it, it's not that there are some place in the world, some uh, types of secure networks that um, uh, that wireless carriers here simply aren't buying because uh, they don't they don't want to. Uh, it's the same network equipment that's available everywhere. It's the same network equipment that is vulnerable to security lapses, to breaches, and uh, uh, I, I think. Uh, I think what Rob is, is getting at really is that uh, uh, we, we may need to think about ways of developing uh, more secure networks and where that has taken place both on the military side and on the corporate side of the United States is, is what are called private networks. Public networks are inherently unsecure uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's coming up with uh, uh, what I would call private networks uh, that, uh, that, that do not connect as clearly to the rest of the Internet that uh, are ways that you have much more secure communications. Yeah, and I, I've lived this for 27 years in there as an Air Force officer, both as a consumer, so I was subject to, uh, you know, the bad connectivity out in the hinterland because guess what? That's where our bases are. But uh, I'll let you consider this. While they're not in the uh, Huawei and ZTE is not in the main carriers, it is in the rural carriers. Guess where the rural carriers are? They're where our military bases are. So we've got Huawei and ZTE equipment surrounding our military bases, surrounding our missile fields. Uh, you know, so think about in terms of the intelligence collection uh, capability that gives uh, you know the Chinese. It's we we just haven't thought deeply enough about this problem. We are so focused, and I'm, I'm speaking now as a former member of the Department of Defense, we are so focused on the away fight, we've completely lost sight of what's happening here at home. Well, on that <laughs> happy note, uh, clearly I think that we're, we're seeing that 5G, to go to the beginning of the discussion, is is a litmus test in a sense for how we're dealing with these with these new challenges and how uh, how democracies need new operating models to compete against authoritarian state actors. And we don't have the models yet, and we haven't deployed them, and we need to do more thinking about them, and we need to do it quickly, actually. Um, this is not a long-term problem set. It's something that, as we started the discussion, it's happening now, uh, and decisions are being made now that will have long-term implications. So I'll open it up uh, to discussion. Um, there's a gentleman there, and then I'll, I'll ask, uh, Chris, are you okay with saying a few comments about NED's work? Um, and then we'll, we'll go around the room. If, if you could also say uh, where you're from, or your name, please. Uh, David Winks with AccuSight. Um, in your earlier comment, uh, it seemed that the value of uh, data about people's life patterns uh, is what drives a lot of the business models for Google and Alibaba. With that data, uh, is there a concern uh, with the recent changes in the Chinese laws requiring Chinese companies to cooperate with Chinese intelligence that somehow they would use that data to uh, do the same sort of composite scoring on Americans that is being done in their own country? Well, if you take four of the largest banks in the world um, uh, are Chinese, you take Alibaba, Baidu, and Tencent, take all the um, uh, consumer um, electronic manufacturing, you combine that all that up and you say, hey, if those gain dominance not only in China but also abroad, that gives them enormous power to move the needle. Now, you can, um, today, you can, China, because of its huge market pool, can influence uh, U.S. corporations to do things they want, like fire their employees that say things about uh, China that they don't like. Imagine a future where you know, your products all of a sudden are, you notice that they're more expensive and you notice that, you know, your, your, your kid didn't get into a certain school. That, that is a future that I see um, coming as multinational corporations lose their um, state 
kind of allegiance because of you know globalization and the internet, but you have an entire um, uh, society of 1.4 billion led by 80 million that actually directs the entire corporate structure of the country towards a specific end, and that end is basically suppression of speech, suppression of religion, and oppression wherever it meets into uh, Chinese domestic law. In other words, Chinese domestic law always, in every case, in every jurisdiction, trumps international law. Chris? So thank you, Nadia. Uh, Chris Walker at the National Endowment for Democracy, and, and really thank you to the speakers. This has been an incredibly thoughtful and illuminating discussion on a very complex topic. I think what I would say is the it sounds to me like the 5G network discussion is of a piece with the larger challenges that have emerged in recent years. And I'd put it this way. Um, we, we've had what I think is unanticipated systems competition, in this case with China, which has a state-driven approach to the world. It sidelines non-governmental actors. It seeks to control expression. And it brings all of the instruments of the state, which are quite formidable, to this end. At the same time, we have enormous systems integration and intersection in ways that were really unimaginable during the Cold War, um, just in the, the depth of the intersection of technology, media, information more generally, culture, education. You can go down the list. And I don't think we uh, really reckoned with this, and we, we kind of sleepwalked into it. And now we're in the middle of it. And the 5G may be the most acute aspect of this. And I think the discussion also reflects that there are no simple solutions. I think what um, I and my colleagues have focused on is what all dimensions of democratic societies can do to respond to this, not just at the official level, but also our non-governmental sectors thinking these things through and coming up with better approaches. I guess one question I would pose on this count, and I think either Nadia or Rob alluded to this, uh, we've looked at developments both in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, and there, there are any number of countries that only have Huawei and ZTE um, operating within these systems. Some of them, young democracies, open systems, uh, they now control the technical choke points. They've also invested hundreds of millions of dollars into media content through CGTN and Xinhua, Radio um, China International and so forth. So you have both the technical infrastructure and to a large degree the kind of media content infrastructure with at a minimum a privileged hand by a power that doesn't respect free expression um, and seeks to suppress it. So I just wonder in the you know, in the larger picture, when we think about allies um, around the world in open societies, what we should be doing in the near to midterm to make sure that they don't get so far into this. They're probably up to their waist now, heading towards their neck. Uh, how we extract them, in a sense, from what is, I think, a pretty tough predicament for their own um, system's integrity. Thanks, Chris. Do Harold or Rob, do you want to comment? Well, we spend $800 billion a year on a defense, uh, this, this would seem to be one area where we could spend a little bit of, of that money on. Um, I agree, we're not going to uh, get much um, with uh, leverage. Um, Huawei has a great strategy. They are proceeding on that strategy. I think uh, they're fully supported by the Chinese state. And so uh, to expect that you know, we can blunt that just by um, going around and having um, you know, diplomatic um, discussions, I don't think that's, it's just not, it's not feasible, it's not possible. It needs a more um, coherent um, strategy with regards to, you know, what is, what is a vision for the future? And then we actually have to put resources uh, toward it. We have to put minds toward it. We have to put money toward it. And we have to think about it in, in a very thoughtful way and then go out and do it. Thanks, Rob. Um, there was a lady, yes, up front, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Li Yang. Uh, it's very important about high tech, and I think for the past several decades, the high tech has really improved a lot. But I think, on the other hand, if you think about the United States, everything is going backward to what I'm 
concern because the productivity is not based on what they can improve to to improve the people's uh, well-being or security. Instead, it's a profit over people. And so government hiring people or, or, or revolving door is basically is uh, used unfair, just an unjust method to reduce the productivity or high tech or improve the, the hacking or spam. The whole thing is really upside down. So I just wonder, how do you ask the government really insist on, on the productivity rather than a lot of things is going backward? You can hire people that say disabled, it's fine, but the problem is use the people less, less pride than go to change people's data or go to change government employment data and then ask the people who are capable to do things to become unemployed. You see a lot of people unemployment on the street and they are so unhappy about our government. So can you do something about it? We see just how much they work on fixing the spam and hacking. I think we, I think we, um, yeah, we can do a quick answer to the. Uh, that's a, maybe a broader question, but do you want to comment um, just briefly? I mean, I think essentially we're talking about uh, technology and, and changing our manufacturing base. But I think, I think. Um, yeah. the, the, the technology there. But the government are not doing that. They are not hiring people to do the right thing on the right direction. Instead, yeah. they're going the backward. Thank you. So, Thank you. This, of course, will cause a lot yeah. of economy benefit. So, I mean, one of the things that, that the way I uh, would answer that is, I mean, this is in the national security strategy, and we thought about it. You know, um, the idea that uh, democratic principles and free market principles go together is enshrined in the Atlantic Charter, it's in the UN Charter, it's in the it's in a system that was conceived of after World War II. And um, what we've allowed here is a, a mix of free market principles and totalitarianism to kind of seep in and kind of corrupt some of that really close-knit um, tie between democratic principles and free market principles. For the most part, our allies and partners, our democratic allies and partners, abide by the uh, international rules of the road. We don't have problems uh, with trade. They're uh, 85 to 90 percent compliant with the Container Security Initiative, uh, for example. I would say that China currently, the data shows 20 percent uh, compliant. I would say they're probably not compliant at all. So it's ha to the extent that we want to actually put those two together, democratic principles and free market principles, that I think you'll start to unleash some of the innovation that we've lost because we've allowed it to be corrupted. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Uh, in the back, uh, um, yeah, you, you, in the black shirt right here, thanks, lady. And then I'll, uh, sorry, I'll get you next. Thank you. Uh, I'm Diane Katz with the Heritage Foundation. Many of these discussions um, focus on hardware, and <clears throat> obviously that's not where the U.S. strength is. Um, but I don't hear as much discussion about our ability to defend and protect through um, software, which is where we do. Uh, you know, surpass others. And and yet the U.S.'s own government IT system is a mess. And so I'd like to hear from the panelists um, why we're not putting more focus, you know, uh, rather than on the, you know, boxes, Huawei boxes, rather than on the defense through software. Good question. And I think also then the relationship between hardware, though, and security, right? Because I think early in the conversation, there's an effort to talk about that. Well, let me make a couple of points. One, uh, when we speak of uh, the network equipment, uh, network equipment really is largely software. Um, so yes, there is a physical Huawei box, but it, the, the real intelligence is in software, both inside the box, but, but really at a, a network operating system. Um, so uh, a, a lot of this is software driven. But you're right, uh, the, the United States really uh, is not a hardware manufacturing, uh, we don't have a lot of hardware manufacturing goes on in the United States. We are a software driven company. We have lots of wonderful 
software oriented companies in the united states whether it's microsoft or oracle or any number of other companies that uh, that uh, are software companies and uh, they are very important companies and uh, a, a lot of um, a lot of the internet is is going towards cloud computing uh, in which the united states is today one of the the leading sources of technology on uh, cloud computing around the world, uh, which raises a whole set of other security issues related to that as well. Uh, but uh, you, you should, please don't leave the conference thinking that um, there, there's no attention being given to, uh, to software issues. Yeah, and I would say you have to look at the entire thing. It's a hardware layer, there's a software layer, there's a data governance model. All of those contribute to, and then there's a network switch, all of those contribute to um, the vulnerabilities that we have today. So you can't just go after any one. I will say that the, that the CPU environments, um, it's a poor design from a security perspective. It's really not something that can be secured. It wasn't designed to be secure. It was designed for speed. So everything that we've, that we've had in terms of our, uh, the evolution of our systems have been designed for speed and connectivity, openness. Okay, so going back and then trying to go back through that data governance model, software um, stack, and hardware layer, and secure it, it, it's a failed endeavor. So you have to go back and you have to th rethink the entire ecosystem and how we would have a different way of looking at it. Now, um, do we, do we match, manufacture most of the hardware in the world? No, but we're actually pretty good at designing new hardware that can meet some of those criteria. So, uh, you know, my suggestion would be we design it and then we begin to think about a coherent system that actually looks at all those areas and tries to come up with a foundation for a future that's secure. That's what you've talked about, too, in some yep. of your writing, building it in, the security. Yep. Thank you. Um, and then, yes, you had a question up here, up front. Thank you. To follow up on that point about the different layers of, of the Internet, sorry, I'm Kim Hart from Axios. Um, I have heard some people speculate that if we're looking at the challenges that you've all that you've been elaborating on this morning and looking at both how the data governance, how data is flowing across borders, the hardware itself, as well as the sophistication of software um, and how it all works together with the cloud, is there a world in which um, maybe not technically speaking, but sort of geopolitically we're look, we're going to end up with maybe more of a fractured internet, whereas an internet that is currently very broad and connects the entire world will be more uh, determined by the borders of which will be more determined by sovereign players than it is today? And is that, is that good or bad? I, we're there already. We're there already. Uh, China is pretty much a closed uh, internet system. Uh, the internet systems in other totalitarian states uh, are very closed as well. Um, it's possible and used a lot, unfortunately, for governments around the world to have choke points uh, on information entering and, and leaving their country. And uh, um, the, uh, the, the concept of the internet is this, this global information highway has uh, developed into a, a global information toll road with uh, checkpoints at different places. Um, uh, I guess I'm a bit of an idealist. I think it would be better if we had the, the global information highway rather than uh, just a lot of uh, choke points. Yeah, and I think we're, you, you know there is a country that's building a global information highway, and that's China. It's called the Belt and Road Initiative. There's a land component. There's a sea component. There's a digital component. It's called the Digital uh, Belt and Road. And so um, you know they now I think Huawei uh, has built out 50% of the undersea cables. When you add in all the dominance uh, around the world in 5G, and they're running fiber in all these countries that they're putting infrastructure projects in. You know, there, so there is a there is a coherent system coming together. It's a it's, it's a system that's based on uh, sovereignty. It's based on suppression of speech. It's based on you know controlling what you do in a digital world. And so, you know, the answer is: Are we going to stand up and 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 have an alternative view? And then, how do we convince democratic allies and partners to adopt that view in a way that preserves our collective freedoms? 
thing to add, I mean, the irony of some of this also is that some of the money being raised uh, for these initiatives are being raised on, you know, in Western capital markets. So, right, our so retirement also funds. A whole, you know, a whole other element as well, but that also gives you Brilliant. an example of opportunities in which, you know, even, even understanding the nature of those relationships is a first step toward perhaps changing things, or at least understanding where. Yeah, you probably didn't know you were investing in your own impression. Uh, in the back, the gentleman, red tie. Thank you. My name is George Folsom, Institute for Political Risk Management Studies. Um, we all saw the Bloomberg articles regarding Supermicro, uh, and the technology press um, excused it, said that it actually didn't happen. Uh, there's a uh, PhD information technologist uh, by the name of Weaver at the University of California at Berkeley, however, who said that indeed it actually could have happened. And from his perspective, what needs to happen is a relocation of what he characterized as the trusted base of our information technology uh, infrastructure uh, back to being manufactured in the United States. He actually advocated repatriation of it. Not the entire, in other words, you wouldn't be cutting China out from the, from the entire supply chain, but just repatriating the trusted base. Do you all have an opinion about that? Well, I, there have been initiatives, uh, and there is one right now on the security supply chain. Um, and um, it's, it's a difficult problem uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, you can't just uh, relocate manufacturing bases uh, that are largely based in China now and, and relocate them somewhere else. Um, uh, Having said that, uh, there there are things that we can do at the margin, and, and we do have at the margin. We do have some some forms of um, uh, uh, manufacturing capability for for certain things, but for for large scale things, for mass market uh, devices, uh, I, I think it's going to be very difficult to to move that to anywhere but. Uh, but low-cost manufacturing locations. Yeah, I think uh, if democracies made a concerted effort to focus on this as an issue, uh, there's enough market pool both in the United States and the rest of the free world, the EU, uh, and in, in, in all of our uh, democratic allies and partners in Asia to actually create enough of a market to, to, to you know, rethink our supply chain for secure microelectronics. So um, this is, um, you know, Basically, the government, the free governments of the world, basically taking a hands-off approach to where they get their hardware. They can, we could come together and say, "Hey, we're going to build um, uh, this this capability, and, and we're going to we're going to protect it too, because it's important to us as democracies." You know, there is an element to be said. It, it, we're not talking here about um, uh, centrally controlled economies. What you're talking about is focus on, on an area that's extremely important to our future and saying we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a say in this. You know, there, there's a numerous um, um, examples where you know, US manufacturers in one industry or another have faced uh, enormous competition from, an av uh, from a, a, um, a manufacturer abroad that was bound and determined to destroy their um, uh, their market share uh, in the U.S. I'll tell you, give you one that's going on right now: rail manufacturer in the U.S. The Chinese basically blew out the Australians. There is no rail manufacturers in in um, in Australia anymore. They're all Chinese, and the same thing's happening here to our own system. Now, they're doing that in an industry where you know there's 50 percent. Um, uh, utilization of their, of their current manufacturing space. So tell me what business model actually makes sense in investing in that market unless you just uh, intend to, to wipe it out. I, look, I, well, let me illustrate the, some of the challenges, though. You take a, you take a handset. There, there are roughly a thousand different components in here. Roughly a thousand probably 700 are manufactured in China by a lot of different companies. Uh, so the security of the supply chain is not just one company. It's not just one manufacturing company. It's not just two manufacturing companies. It's hundreds of different manufacturing companies. And right now, 
a lot of that manufacturing base is in China. And, and kind of, rec it's, it's one thing to relocate one company or one line of business, maybe two, but to, to relocate hundreds is very difficult. And it, at the end of the day, you're still going to be dependent on uh, uh, a, a lot of components coming from, from China. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, the gentleman in the red sweater, and then. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Simon Ateba from todaynewsafrica.com. Uh, Africa seems to be in the receiving end. We most countries will use 3G, and Chinese companies seems to be everywhere. Uh, I wanted you to make some comment about Africa and uh, the influence of the Chinese, and if the U.S. are trying to do something. I was born in Cameroon, and a few not long ago, the, because of protests and the president uh, cut the internet in a particular region for several months. And, and he was able to do that because the Chinese are very much involved in the country. So if you can make some comment about Africa. Thank you. you know, I think that um, you know, the national security strategy uh, did actually acknowledge that Africa is an arena of geopolitical competition. It raised the issue up um, as an important one. Uh, there's bipartisan support for understanding how this competition is, is unfolding. The BUILD Act, for instance, is a small step toward addressing, at least trying to address some of the One Belt, One Road uh, issues in terms of providing American businesses with opportunities to do more investments in infrastructure. So at the, at the very least, I think there's a, a growing awareness, which again is a first step um, to, toward the problem set. That doesn't mean we're actually <laughs> solving it right now or working you know, toward the concrete solutions that we need to, but um, I think also a first step is getting key African states to understand that they're a key part of this too and they're going to be making choices. But to Rob's point, we want to be able to provide them with alternatives, right? Yeah, and I would say, our, you know, our former colleagues at the NSC absolutely get uh, your point and are focused on this. I would say the federal bureaucracy is probably the biggest ship with the smallest rudder in the history of mankind. And so national security said, strategy said we need to go in a different direction. It's going to take departments and agencies a while to figure that out. And you're going to see uh, in the coming decade or two decades, I would imagine, a whole series of legislation that comes out addressing this issue, a whole shift in the way we, we, um, we do foreign policy, we do diplomacy, we do informational uh, exchanges, we do um, uh, economic engagements. Uh, so, you know, I, I would characterize we've got, you know, if we have this uh, a bipolar personality in the federal government. We've got this really strong guy. He uh, goes out and fights a lot. And then this other guy that's got the diplomacy, uh, economic, and informational uh, portfolio, he's kind of been sleep, at sleep at the wheel, and, he, and he's been eating too many Cheetos. We need to get him exercising and out there. You know, and it doesn't help when we're, when we're constantly increasing our military arm and we're not increasing our diplomatic, informational, and economic expertise. And so we need to, we need to get that guy off the couch and, uh, and exercising and, and out there. Harold? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Sounds good to me. No Cheetos. Okay. Um, I, I had, yeah, the lady in the back. This, and then, okay. Uh, I'm in a building and working for Business Finland here in, here in D.C. And just want to mention in the beginning that uh, uh, there's actually the world's first uh, 6G summit taking place in Finland at the moment, in, in Finnish Arctic, uh, actually. But, but my question, uh, usually uh, the biggest threat uh, to cybersecurity and, and all the securities is the end user. Uh, so we so we all human beings. So I would like to ask about your views. Uh, what kind of emphasis, or is there a need to, to put more emphasis uh, how to to probably raise awareness or or skills of the of the end users, also in regarding uh, regarding 5G and uh, and cybersecurity in in 5G era. Thank you. That's actually a great question. I'd like to take that on. So when you come out of your door each day, do you take it upon yourself to defend yourself? Are, are you are you basically protecting your neighborhood? Do you ensure that everybody else follows the traffic rules? That's essentially what each individual faces in the digital space today, right? They're on their own. And all I'm saying is the government does have a role in making sure that 
you know, you can step out in a digital world that you can feel safe in. And what that structure looks like. Harold? Um, look, I, I think you're right. There are a lot of there are a lot of threats related to cybersecurity. Some of them have to do with the end user. Some of them have to do with the, the network itself and, and the ease of sabotaging it. Um, I, I frankly think that's the, the greatest concern with uh, network security is potential for sabotage. I'm less concerned about it for uh, uh, collection of information because there's massive collection of information on all networks in the world today. Um, uh, but the, the end user, and, and we've seen this, we see lots of, there, there, there are a lot of bad actors in the world. There are a lot of people who can easily be bribed to become bad actors. And, and that's, uh, that's just part of human nature, and that's not going to change, unfortunately. Um, the, the way in which individuals use the Internet and, and just the, the blind acceptance that everything's going to be all right, I think that's a very big problem. We, we tend to, I think, probably put too much information on the internet that uh, a lot of times we later come to regret. Yeah, when we were working on this in the White House, you know, and I talked, spoke to a lot of engineers that build networks for a living. Um, you know, I remember one particular meeting went almost two hours. And, you know, it's very hard for us to imagine a different kind of world than we live in today because this is the world we grew up in. But if you could imagine what that world would look like, that's what we need to build. And it was about two hours into this conversation when one of the engineers says, but we don't build networks that way. And I said, that's exactly the point. And, and to, to your point, can we ask more of the private sector to start giving us some of those options and expectations that they have a role to play in this too? When you get into a car, you have certain expectations that the car is going to be built in a certain way so that you can, you know, there's in, in, in a similar way. I don't know the exact answer, but I think it's a question that individuals can ask more and more and should, and should get answers from. Yeah, and how many times has an American been told that's impossible and they've gone out and done it? So um, we had uh, the lady in the green right up here, and then, and then I'll um, get to you. Um, thank you. I'm Olivia Zhang with China's Taishi Media. So uh, our topic today is competing perspective, but I'm wondering whether the panel would talk about cooperation. As uh, as you mentioned, like a cell phone might involve hundreds of uh, companies that needs cooperation. So firstly, is 5G cooperation between U.S. and China is completely off the table in the foreseeable future. And secondly, will U.S. be okay for uh, China to co cooperate with other countries, especially you know U.S. allies? Um, based on recent trips of Secretary Pompeo, it doesn't seem like the U.S. is okay with that. So I'm wondering how would the panel think about it. Thanks. I'm not quite sure I fully understood the question, but uh, is there room for cooperation? I think. Oh, is there room for cooperation? Five G network and and the role of you know how we think about cooperation in the U S. and China in this endeavor. Uh, look, I imagine there are discussions going on between the State Department and the Chinese Foreign Ministry all the time on a wide range of issues. Uh, uh, Cooperation is always possible. Uh, I don't think we're, we're there yet. Uh, I'm not privy to those conversations, so I, I just don't know. I mean, for now, for really for years, Huawei equipment is, uh, has been banned from the major networks. Rob makes a good point. There is Huawei equipment in uh, some of the smaller carriers out in rural America. Rob? Yeah, I would say until um, there's an effort to um, change this increasingly um, increasing need to restrict speech, freedom of religion, and oppression in the People's Republic of China, that the idea that we would, we would cooperate on something so foundational to our future success is really, um, you know, in my mind, it's, it's a non-starter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first, yeah. Um, there are two questions here. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Uh, my question is, uh, if you think about Huawei, they sign so many contracts uh, with countries around the world. They have very kind of a successful business model or uh, that is supported by Chinese government. They supported, they created such of um, national champions uh, by uh, supporting them uh, financially or uh, even diplomatically. Uh, but um, for United States, how can we have a and some other strategy that can really uh, trump this kind of uh, business model or <laughs> yeah I, I think that that's sort of what we're trying to raise in in general at the, at the panel and and we see sort of compete not competing viewpoints actually because I think you're <laughs> it's um we're we're struggling I think with identifying the model we, we need a public private kind of model that actually plays to our strengths right um you know, today businesses are incentivized to do what they do by our set of rules and laws in this country and by the way the federal government spends its money. We can change. Those can be changed. It, it, it's only to imagine for us to reset the landscape in terms of what are the incentives? How do we spend our money? What, what do we want companies to, to make profit doing? They have to make a profit. That's the way our system works. And so, how do we how do we how do we want to incentivize them to make that profit? Carol, one thing that's different in this area than in something else, let's say, airlines or agricultural equipment, the the firms that are competing for the contracts around the world typically are not American companies. Cisco, to some extent, but but largely speaking, the major network equipment manufacturers are, are not American companies. And so uh, it, it's not that we have a national champion in the same way that China has a national champion, um, but the, the countries that, that do have, uh, that, that are not China are, it's, it's Finland, it's Sweden, it's Korea. These are very important countries, but they're, they're not, these are not the global, um, um, global influence countries, if you will. And, and so uh, those countries probably do have their own system of uh, trying to, to help their, their companies, but it's, it's uh, for the U.S., it's a, it's a very different situation. It, it's not that we go in and sort of say, well, we're going to use OPEC and, uh, and all kinds of government subsidies to help them. It's, well, wait a minute, no, that's, they're not our companies anyway. Yeah, and, and if, if you know China came in and said, "Hey, we're going to buy Boeing. We're going to take it all all back to China," we'd say, "Hold, hold on a second. We 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 want to have Boeing as a prime military contractor." So, I mean, it's just it it, it is you ha you have to relook um, in this country what is the value of industrial policy and how can it be done in a way that actually continues to promote our uh, free market principles, but also protects the kind of key industries that we need for the 21st century. And I would just say, I mean, I, I see Rob's point earlier on about American leadership, but this is not just an American issue, yep. right? I mean, this is, I mean, there's no reason why our allies and partners in Europe can't be at the forefront helping to develop some solutions to these problem sets. Um, and, and, you know, why isn't that happening, or to what degree is that happening, right? To, uh, I think there was another question up here. Thank you. I'm Satoshi Nishata from Happy Science USA. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the, approach, the approach we should take regarding 5G depends on uh, what, what kind of level of threat, what, uh, what level of threat uh, regarding 5G. And uh, I think the threat of, China has been, threat of China has been underestimated for, for a long time, in, especially in the United States. Um, uh, so I wonder uh, uh, what, what is the, the ultimate goal or uh, destination for China uh, regarding 5G? So I'd like to know your perspective on China's purpose. So how, wh why they are moving so rapidly ahead to 5G issues? Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, just for me personally, <laughs> Uh, leave aside what China is and, 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 and what the Communist Party wants to do, that really shouldn't concern us so much. Who do we want to be as a nation? 
I think preservation of the Republic is probably paramount in, in everything that we think about going forward. It should be how do we preserve our freedoms? How do we preserve the kind of society that we want to live in? We can answer those questions without looking at any other country. We can just look to ourselves. And we have everything that we need. And, and, and when we do that, we can look to all those uh, countries around the world that's, that actually agree with the way uh, you know, we, we want to live. I, I would say from an economic perspective that uh, uh, wireless technology has been uh, one of the greatest innovations probably in the history of, of humanity. Uh, it has literally helped bring communications to billions of people who until 20 years ago had no way of communicating beyond how far they could speak by voice. Um, it, it, uh, it has been profoundly important to uh, uh, the development of society in the past 20 years. Um, and it's been very important to the United States. Uh, lots of speak to young people today, what do they want to do? They want to go into high tech, they want to go into startups, they want to develop some app. They want to do something related to this new industry called uh, high tech in the wireless sector. Um, and and that's, that's all been a good thing. Uh, and we want to be sure that that remains in a competitive environment, an environment in which uh, Americans can uh, play a meaningful role, and an environment in which this new technology continues to evolve in a, in a useful direction. I think we have time for one or two more questions. A gentleman in the back. Uh, James Sang, IBM Research, retired. Harold, you talked about national champions, and you, but earlier on you mentioned that there were a lot of American companies that merged out or went out of business. Yeah. What can we learn from the experience? Well, Nortel wasn't an American company, but it's Canadian. Canadian, yeah. Lucent. What can Lucent, we tell yeah. about? What can we learn from the experience of American companies over the last twenty years in this sector? Uh, it wasn't Chinese who drove them out, out of business. No, exactly. Uh, it, it's. Um, Look, competition is uh, competition is is mean and nasty, and uh, it, it is not something that you can rest on your laurels. And you just always have to be efficient and and looking for uh, looking for new ideas. And, and so we've gone from a situation where twenty the the business history of uh, high tech over the past 30 years is littered with the corpses of bankrupt companies that used to be at the cutting edge, and and today are they're just they're just gone. Uh, competition has been great because what it, at, what has happened at the, at the same time is technology has just raced ahead, and, and the companies that don't that cannot innovate and cannot cannot do better. Uh, are, are not going to make it. Um, and uh, these companies have also operated in a largely unregulated environment without a lot of government interference. And, and that's, uh, that's been a good thing. And, and in the United States, the, the, we've, we have migrated to certain sectors where we are really, really good. And, and those tend to be Software and customer interface, advertising, marketing, uh, the Googles, Amazons of the world, uh, we're, we're really good at that. Uh, and and we, we haven't been quite as good at kind of uh, the manufacturing side of things. Yeah, the only caveat I'd add to that is there hasn't been a lot of U.S. government intervention. There's been plenty of Chinese government intervention. So let's say that you go out and have a football game and you bring 11 players and you're playing by the rules and all of a sudden the team that comes out puts 22 players out there. How are you going to deal with that? Well, where's the referee to actually make sure that we have 11 players on both sides and one team's not you know, basically violating all the rules? Essentially... You can't say there has been zero government intervention. There's been huge government intervention. It just hasn't come from the U.S. government. Before China became an important player, so that's, as Harold said, that's the normal competitive process. We seem to have painted ourselves into a corner, but that's... 
and, and, I, and I would say the Trump administration says, great, let's have competition. Let's have fair competition where you bring 11 players and I bring 11 players. Let's don't let you bring 22 players and then I bring 11. I think also it's worth thinking about, and I don't know the answer to this question, but where is the innovation and uh, the young engineers in Silicon Valley, where are they putting their efforts, right? What kinds of technologies, right? right? Technologies to make my life easier as a consumer or technologies that affect some of these core areas that we're talking about? And I don't know the answer to that completely, but I think it's, it's, it's worth considering. And I think 5G is going to be actually one of those great um, uh, spurs for innovation in the United States as long as we get it right. And there's, a, there's kids that, have, that are going to come up with ideas that we haven't even thought of on the basis of this you know, nationwide secure 5G network. But if it doesn't get built, or if it gets built um, you know, in, in a way where we're actually no longer sort of a technology leader, well, then we're left picking up all the pieces that everybody else designs. So I think uh, we're about uh, time to end. Uh, we do have time for one final question. But OK, well, gentlemen up front. Hi, David Winks with AccuSite. Have we considered uh, modifying the EIS contract, which the government uses to buy telecom services, to include things like supply chain uh, uh, security as part of that contract? I think there are some changes in that area, right? In the, They're in talking the about it. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming. We see this really as the start of a conversation. I think it was a good start to a conversation. There are clearly several other areas um, that we can work on building on this, and I hope to see you in the future. Thank you.